Hello and thank you for yet another webinar of EPC Law, The Impossible Puzzle of Cybersecurity. Today we're going to discuss why organizations are still struggling to reduce cyber risk. Outside threats vary around the world. How synchronized security can help solve the impossible puzzle. For this webinar, we have with us Ben from Sophos. A very warm welcome, Ben. Thank you so much for having me. Ben, he has so he is a global solutions and an engineer at Sophos. He holds experience of 15 years in both sales and engineering within the IT industry. Over to you. Thank you so much, Ria, and uh, thank you everyone for joining today. As Ria said, I'm Ben Vasharan, and I'm part of the global solutions engineering team at Sophos, and um, I've got a pretty unique role. I I have the privilege of uh, having uh, quite a bit of freedom in my role and I spend most of my time researching and understanding the threat landscape and applying the different tools, tactics and procedures that uh, cyber criminals are using on a regular basis and uh, get, get to test them against our own product as well as other vendors and get to learn to think like a cyber, uh, a cyber criminal. So I consider myself incredibly lucky uh, in what I get to do and I do love the privilege of uh, getting to talk to large audiences. I, uh, I've I'm only recently back from uh, a security event in Goa, uh, which is a very beautiful part of India, and it was a privilege to go there for a week. And um, yeah, I hope I get invited back next year, that's for sure. So um, today I'm going to talk about the impossible puzzle of cybersecurity. And um, to give you a bit of a, an idea, you know, Sophos is a huge global cybersecurity company. For those of you that haven't heard of us before, we've been around for about 36 or 37 years now, um, and we specialize in everything security. We don't deviate from security at all. Now, we're in a great position because we get to see, you know, roughly 500,000 unique malware samples every day and we generate billions um, of requests every day and we get to see a lot from a malware perspective. But what we like to do um, numerous times during the year is go out and use independent uh, researchers and third parties to actually you go out there and interview in, uh, stakeholders and key professionals within organizations. And for this particular survey that we did, uh, we we interviewed about 3,100 IT decision makers um, over December 2018 and January 2019, so at the start of this year. Now, of those, uh, 300 were from India, and some of them were from small businesses, so anywhere from uh, 100 to 1,000 employees, and some of them were much larger, 1,000 to 5,000 employees. And as I learned from uh, my experience in Goa and talking to some uh, some CEOs over there and CIOs in, um, in India, I discovered that even 5,000 employees isn't necessarily a large organization in India, um, but it still gives us a good representation of how uh, organizations are going with cybersecurity and this helps us because we can educate the masses but it also uh, helps us because we know which direction to grow and build our product. So what I want you to take away from today's information is if you're an IT decision maker, if you're at a C-level or if you're a technical person, um, know that you're not alone. Cybersecurity has got incredibly hard and, and is getting harder. That's why we called it the impossible puzzle of cybersecurity. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, in this survey, we discovered that two in three organizations fell victim to some sort of cyber attack in 2018. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that attackers managed to break in and steal all their information. It means that someone has actually targeted them or they've experienced some kind of opportunistic attacker that is trying to uh, break into their organization uh, now, whether it's stopped or not, it doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is um, someone did try to break in and they fell victim to a cyber attack, whether it was blocked or not. So that's quite a high number. So as a decision maker on the call today, know that if your find in security is getting more sophisticated and harder, you're definitely not alone. So 
what was amazing is when we conducted this survey is it's not um, just two in three organizations that fell victim. We, we found that on average um, there was two uh, successful attacks. So of those organizations that have fallen victim, they actually have multiple attacks against, against them. And what was alarmingly high is 10% of the people, remember that we only surveyed uh, 3,100 people, 10% of them experienced four or more attacks. Um, that actually got through their, their defenses. So a cyber criminal managed to get something to run inside of their environment. From that, we also deduced that traditional cybersecurity is starting to struggle. And to be honest, uh, in my position, I do get a little bit frustrated by what I like to call industry buzzwords, you know, AI, machine learning, um, zero day. But when people talk about next generation products, what they're talking about is signatureless attacks and, uh, sorry, signatureless detection. So not needing to see a threat first before we can actually block that threat first. And what we've found is nine out of 10 victims that we surveyed that experienced a breach were running up-to-date cybersecurity software or hardware at the time of their most significant attack. So, that means that traditional cybersecurity, things that rely on signatures, isn't necessarily the best form of defense anymore. And, you know, I can talk more about this in detail if you'd like. Um, please ask any questions about how we can we now detect in attacks in 2019 without identities or without signatures. But um, the key takeaway here is that's not good enough anymore. Um, if you are using older technology, if you are hesitant to change and you know that you're using, say, endpoint protection that requires multiple updates every day to detect malware, you're, you're probably at a much higher risk or you definitely are at a much higher risk than uh, an organization that uh, is running what we like to call next generation or signatureless based detection. So we discovered that um, there's also multiple areas of concern. And what you're seeing up the top, uh, around the top, is the three main concerns for IT managers and decision makers. And I find this fascinating. So the number one concern was data loss. So from people that responded, 31 of them, 31% uh, said that their number one concern was uh, losing their data. And this was actually um, the top three concern for most organizations. So 68% of respondents had it in their top three. So people aren't necessarily worried about uh, the financial costs, so we'll, though we'll talk about that in a moment, um, or their personal reputation brand. Um, they're mainly focused on data loss. And that can be anything from um, I, I, personal identifiable information, PII, as we like to call it, or this can be like intellectual property and a lot of cybersecurity startups or a lot of startups in general now are holding on to technology and uh, ideas that aren't yet painted and uh, they don't yet belong to them. So we, we need to really consider what it would mean if an attacker was able to steal your most valuable information. Um, and when people look at me concerned when I talk about this, one of the things that I like to highlight is uh, look at Facebook. Facebook is a free app and most people on the call today are probably using Facebook. Uh, Facebook have never charged their users a cent, yet they're a multi-billion dollar organization. Um, one of the biggest startups I believe we've seen in tech for a very long time as well since the dot-com boom. Um, and the reason why I bring up Facebook is have a look at where their money's coming from. A lot of it's from revenue, uh, from advertising, but a lot of it is also because what they're able to do with the uh, data that um, they're giving third parties to mine. So we know that in 2019, data is the new gold. It's um, something that everybody wants their hands on because when you're able to steal information, um, you, you've got power, you've got control. Um, amazingly, <clears throat> Damage to business was a number one concern for 21% of IT managers. And that's really fantastic. That means that IT managers are now not just thinking about IT and protecting IT, they're thinking about the company that pays their bills. And of course, that was a top three concern for a lot of IT 
uh, managers that responded. And finally, cost and time uh, was a number one concern for, again, 21% of IT managers. And um, the focus was equally split between um, both money and time. So we've put those two together. Um, so if you find yourself spending on not having enough money um, because uh, for your cybersecurity practices or you're finding that your teams just don't have enough time, uh, you're not alone. Um, look at what your peers are saying in this particular uh, survey. What I found amazing though is if you look at the pie chart down in the bottom uh, of the slide, we've got our top three concerns. Um, what was quite low is personal job security, dealing with compliance and auditors, and some people didn't have any concern. So, and a lot of people, uh, sorry, none had, I don't have any concerns, but 13% had, I don't know. And the one here that's fascinating is personal job security. I actually thought that would be much higher. And I say that because if we look at, say, the Equifax breach from uh, a couple of years ago, every C-level executive that was part of Equifax ended up getting sacked. And what was really sad is the CSO at the time, the chief security officer, she was clearly incredibly intelligent, um, but she had a degree in music. And the internet ridiculed her um, because she didn't have a degree in cybersecurity, although she was clearly intelligent, she had a degree in music. Um, her name ended up in a lot of headlines, was a part of hate speech, and um, her getting a job in cybersecurity, which is clearly a passion for her, um, is highly unlikely. So one of the things you need to think about as well is if your business, if you can't get buy-in from the board or from sea levels and you're trying to influence change, think about your own job security if you know that you are wide open for an attack. And that's a that's something you should hold on to and something you should be proud of. Um, you should never have to sacrifice integrity for, uh, for, the, for the business you're working on. So why are people struggling? Why is cybersecurity getting harder? Well, the number one concern that we got was attacks are coming from multiple directions. And I think that's pretty fair to say because we found that it was quite evenly spread. Um, so as you can see here, 33% um, of attacks um, came in from email. I actually thought it would be a little bit higher from that. Um, when I'm talking to full-time red teamers, when I'm uh, working on penetration tests myself, when I'm talking to friends that do penetration tests um, and red team exercises, um, email is still the general initial um, a vehicle for attacking an organization. Remote desktop has become a little bit more popular. I just did a forensic response on an organization that uh, uh, got attacked via remote desktop protocol. But um, all in all, I would say over history, email is the, still the easiest way for attackers to break in. Um, again, 30% or um, we found that, uh, yeah, three in 10 attacks came from the web. So downloading malware, um, this is a difficult one to define though. And this is why maybe why email is lower than I thought is um, how do you constitute a web attack? If someone clicks on a link in an email and goes to a malicious website, is that an email attack or is that a web attack? And these are things you need to think about. We found that software vulnerabilities was at 23%. What was crazy here though, is India is up at 35% of attacks. So from the Indian companies we surveyed, um, you can see that 35% um, of them said the most significant attack came from a software vulnerability, also known as exploitation. And I actually wanna talk about that a little bit more in a moment. And of course, USB drives and external devices are incredibly high as well. And um, we've seen telemetry from our own software alone uh, from our own Sophos labs um, to see that it is an incredibly high vector as well. Um, alarmingly, 25% of attacks in Mexico came from USB drives and external devices. But if we break it down per region, then you can specifically see where India sits here. Um, there's uh, quite a few, 13% um, come from an external device, but um, by no means it is at the highest. You know, um, we look at Australia, it's um, 7%. We've got Japan on 15%, South Africa, 21%. It's consistently average in India. The biggest jump for India though is via software that people were using. And there's a number of theories behind it and none of them have really been proven. And this is frustrating, something that I would like to do a lot of research on, but I would actually need a lot of help and a lot of intel and a lot of sensors. But um, with software exploitation so high in India, 
Some, soft, uh, some security professionals hypothesize that this is due um, to piracy and some enterprises are, are using uh, pirated software which is making them a target. Um, so it's speculated that India is um, potentially one of the highest companies, uh, countries when it comes to software piracy, but that isn't actually proven. That's more come that more comes from um, antivirus detections and you know keylogger detections and things like that. So I don't necessarily believe that hypothesis, but that's what some people believe. I'm all lean towards the fact that uh, India is such a big country. Uh, with a huge population and as you're all well aware you've also got really large enterprises there. Now with every enterprise one of the biggest challenges we have is patching and change control. So if you've got a organization and you have 20,000 employees or 30,000 employees or more, how do you patch every device on time and how do you get your accuracy high enough? How do you do it with multiple offices and how do you do it with people that work from home? So this is why I spend so much time talking about this 35% in India. I think that we really need to get a group on software within India to say how do we patch regularly, how do we patch often, and how do we keep our software secure. So as a key takeaway from those uh, from today, think about that and see um, see where your mind goes. Have a think about your own organization. Um, of course, malicious and compromised websites are incredibly high for India as well. Um, but they're high for every region and um, again phishing is also high so if we combined um, the malicious website and email we would probably say that about 50% of attacks are coming from phishing so these are the things to think about with India um, hopefully you've all had a chance while I talk to read the different statistics um, I found it a lot quite alarming that Germany and Canada were incredibly high with phishing um, and I also found it uh, quite surprising that Australia is actually quite high um, via software um, exploits as well, very close to India at 29%. Um, I believe that's because due to small businesses um, are terrible at patching and MSPs need to do a, a better job. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware um, where I'm from in Australia, um, the average business size is less than 20 people per business. So um, most organizations don't have an IT person, they have an MSP that's taking care of many thousands of customers. So if we look at uh, different security risks, so during the survey we actually asked organizations what are your top three security risks and this is a combination, this is the top five that came through. So most people are concerned about phishing which is fair, you know, 50%. Software exploitation was remarkably high but what I found fascinating is people was very high, internal staff, contractors and visitors. and uh, it's it's fascinating because we've there's always been this term uh, it's from when I worked in a help desk as a junior uh, when I was you know 15 16 years old is uh, P, I think it's payback the problem exists between the keyboard and chair and um, it's funny that today we still have uh, or assume that people are the problem insiders are the risk um, but if you're of that mindset if you're of that concern it's probably accurate. <clears throat> But you can also see here that we've got, you know, with fishing at number one and people at number three, you could almost combine those two. Unless you're worried about an insider stealing information or selling information, you would say your biggest risk is probably an insider plugging in a USB drive by accident or clicking on a phishing email. Um, one thing to consider here is um, better spend of uh, of education and user awareness training, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Um, fascinatingly, insecure wireless networking is quite high and I actually got in an argument with our principal threat researcher. Uh, we were over in Perth together two weeks ago, so on the west coast of Australia, and I'm still quite concerned about bad wireless and public wireless. And he laughed at me and told me I'm a fool. He, uh, his opinion was, well, I'm using a secure device. I have my firewall turned on on the device as well. I don't have any public facing ports. And every, you know, uh, the Mozilla Foundation's just come out to say 92% of the internet 
is now encrypted. And if you think about every HTTPS connection or TLS connection as a mini VPN, a secure tunnel, the chance of an attacker doing something malicious with my traffic is incredibly low. So hopefully we see this insecure wireless network and start to drop off. And of course, unknown devices was quite high as well. Now, one of the things that's also been said is cyber attacks are multi-staged, coordinated and blended. And I actually totally agree with this. I, I mentioned earlier, I did a forensic response for an organization earlier this week. I helped an organization decipher how they fell victim to an attack. Um, they weren't a Sophos customer for the record, um, but they had met me at a Sophos event and contacted me when they were desperate. And um, what was amazing is this attack was definitely coordinated. They brute forced remote desktop and found credentials for an account called Test2. Um, once they successfully had credentials, it took about 15 minutes for another login to come from that Test2 account. And it was clearly that they had used a, a method of automation to break that password and break into that organization. Once they got notification of a uh, correct password, then a human took over. So the fact that we're saying that attacks are now multi-stage coordinated and what we call blended, as in somewhat automated and then a person takes over, is very accurate. So when we look at multi-stage attacks and how people got, uh, or the type of attacks people had, you know, 53% um, of people uh, responded to say they had phishing emails sent to their organization. 41% of people that also responded said that um, they had experienced a data breach and lost malware. Um, I, it's hard to tell the difference between malicious code and ransomware, um, but 35% of people had malicious code or software exploitation take place. What I find alarming is 30% had ransomware. We'll talk about that further in a moment. Um, but what's amazing here as well is we've got 21% as credential theft. And I find this really fascinating because um, credential theft is really, really valuable. And I say that because um, if you're able to break into an organization, you want to find a method of persistence. So what you try and do is you use a technique called privilege escalation and then try and steal further credentials. So should you lose that method of access that you first used, you can then use credentials to say, maybe log into an email account or do some further damage. So 21% um, of, of attacks involve some form of credential theft um, is not surprising to me. Um, phishing, as you can see, number one attack vector. Um, over half of the cyber attack victims um, had had a phishing email hit them before. Um, Germany being the highest and Brazil being the next highest. Um, India being on average with most of the rest of the, uh, the world. Um, software exploits, like I said, on average 35%. Um, Mexico actually had more software exploitation attacks than India. It just wasn't the worst um, attack that they actually had. And um, it's funny, if I go back to the, um, the attack that I was talking about earlier that I did forensic response to, um, they used a software exploit within Windows itself to gain a higher form of privilege. So it's not uncommon when we say that attacks are blended and coordinated coordinated to see that an attack has broken in. Once they've got their initial foothold, they then use software exploitation to further enhance their foothold on that organization. And, you know, some people say that ransomware is dead and um, it's just, it's certainly not the case. As you can see here, um, ransomware is very much alive. Uh, 31, sorry, 30% 30 of um, people that experienced a cyber breach had some form of ransomware and 50% of attacks in, in, in Japan involved ransomware. Um, so there's so much to be talked about from a ransomware perspective, um, which we, we might touch on right at the end. Um, and then, you know, we can see here that 40% of attacks in India or 39% of attacks in India were, of course, um, ransomware as well. And, you know, for, a com for countries um, with big economies that are wealthy, you know, look at Japan, look at India, look at Australia, look at the UK. Um, we've got these booming economies and cyber criminals know that. 
Cyber criminals know that if they can break into a large organization in these big countries, um, it's worth demanding a ransom because chances are people are going to pay it so their business can move on and so they don't lose a huge amount. One thing that's fascinating though is think about the cost of a ransomware attack because you may pay to get your files back, you may get the decryption key, you still need to then decrypt all of your data, but then you need to go through and pay forensic specialists to clean out your system and make sure there's no trace of an attacker left, re-image devices, that kind of thing. So the cost of a ransomware attack um, is actually significantly higher than the ransom itself. And um, Hopefully this rings true to a lot of people, but technology, talent and time are all hard to go by. And I think technology is getting better. In fact, I know technology is getting better. I work for a company that's innovating at such a rapid pace to stop uh, cyber attacks. But talent and time is something that every country complains about. However, India uh, is the leaders in spending time on cybersecurity. So out of all the respondents from our survey, India came in at 32% of people said that their IT team, is 32% um, of their time is spent managing IT security. That's time they're not spent innovating, updating. Um, this is them dealing with IT security problems. Does this need, mean that you need a bigger IT security team or do things more efficiently. There's a number of different ways to look at this, um, but it's still alarmingly high. Uh, Japan managed to come in at the lowest at 19%, but everyone else was above 20% here. And um, that's a lot of time spent for a, an IT department. Um, so we say, you know, 26%, um, but that's not the right ratio. Um, we, we need to get this balance um, a little bit better. Um, you know, a majority of people that responded said that the amount of time that their IT team is spending is not the right. Uh, they, they expect their IT team to focus on better projects and innovate um, and more so than having to deal with cybersecurity. Um, what was amazing is 86% of respondents said that they need better skills uh, in-house, which is, is quite in, interesting. Um, uh, so when you think about that, um, you know, cyber security threats are getting more complicated. It's becoming harder and harder to, um, to manage threats, respond from threats. It's becoming much more expensive to hire an incident responder. I have a friend of mine that's doing forensic incident response and he charges about $800 Canadian an hour unless you want him same day and then his rates double to $1,600 an hour. So as you can imagine, most organizations are at the point where they're saying, well, I want to uh, I want to have skills in house. I need more cybersecurity skills in house, so I'm not outsourcing to super expensive, high demand resources. Um, so have a think about that. Um, and if you are struggling when it comes to finding the right talent, I don't think uh, you need to feel like you're isolated alone. Alone. Um, what's fascinating though is eight in ten said that they're struggling to recruit the right skills. And um, India was, of course, up at the highest here, which is at 90%. Um, what I find fascinating here is if you look at IT professionals and cybersecurity professionals um, specifically, um, India's got a huge amount of talent. Um, and a lot of them are, are getting enticed to go and work overseas or work remotely. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it really comes down to they can almost demand how much they're getting paid. So it's not just trying to find the person with the right skills, but how do you inf uh, how do you pay them and how do you keep them engaged so they're actually interested? And I've heard a few theories behind this. Um, some organizations now in the US are saying, if you come and work for us, you only actually have to work for us three days a week. Two other days a week, you're allowed to sit at your desk and work on projects or things that interest you. Um, we still want you at your desk and ready to work in case we experience a problem. However, two days of those a week, you can work on a pet project, a personal project, security research, anything that you want to work on. So people are trying to come up with more creative ways to give people jobs that they want and keep them engaged. But of course, money comes in and plays with that as well. Um, budget for people and technology is too low. 
two in three respondents agreed with that. And, um, you know, 81% of respondents um, in India agreed that the cybersecurity budget is below what it needs to be. So if you're struggling to recruit the right people or retain the right people, it could be a budget thing. By all means, screenshot this and send it to your board to say, look, I'm not alone. We need more money. Um, <clears throat> but the other thing that we need to talk about here is proper investment. And I say that because hopefully in your organization, you've got some form of tiered access. So, you know, someone in accounts can't access HR's data and someone in HR, to can't, HR or human resources can't access someone in accounting's data. Um, but we, we really need to look at those individuals that get fished the most and who has access to the highest risk information. What the attitude we see quite often is sci or IT departments want to say run phishing simulation every quarter for everyone in the organization. And that's not a bad strategy, but what does that actually achieve? You could be spending loads of money on computer-based training and get very few results when maybe you're better to say, well, why don't we only fish once a year? Or why don't we fish our, not fish our staff members at all? But why don't we pick our high risk departments? Why don't we pick accounts? Why don't we pick human resources? Why don't we pick our board and C-level executives? Because they all have access to our valuable information. Let's invest money in fishing them and fishing them only. And let's do really targeted, let's do sophisticated phishing, but let's also maybe not just do computer-based training. Why don't we get a professional trainer to come in? Why don't we get a white hat hacker, someone that does this on a regular basis to come in and explain the risks and the problems um, if you fail a fish? And why don't we spend the money just educating those people that if they are breached could horrendously affect our organization. So have a think about that and how that applies to your organization and um, maybe change in how you're spending money on people and technology and maybe focusing on the right risks is the best thing to do. The other thing that I come across quite often is organizations want to protect against what's sexy. And you might say, Ben, that's a really weird way to put it. And when I say people want to protect against what's sexy, what I actually mean by that is people read news articles and they read uh, cybersecurity blogs and they read about these groups like Fancy Bear that are trying to hack every medical organization in the world apparently before the Beijing Olympics. And we're finding that people want to invest their money in trying to stop, you know, the James Bonds of the world, the spies, the government commissioned agencies. And yeah, it's fun to speculate and it feels cool to be a part of something that's hopefully going to stop that government from breaking in. But when we look at the type of attacks that people are experiencing, it's not James Bond, it's not Jane Bond, it's not a government. These are opportunistic hackers. These are people that are just trying to break in, encrypt your data and demand a ransom. So if you approach this problem with that attitude, maybe you can realize that you don't need to spend huge amounts of money on upping your defenses against nation states and maybe you need to start investing your money in an area where um, uh, you're going to see more reward, where it's going to reduce the load of your IT department. So stop trying to think about what's sexy. Stop trying to think about the Jane and James Bond. How can you think about those opportunistic cyber criminals that obviously want to get their hands on your, uh, your money, your, your, your financials or your intellectual property? So we really come to this impossible puzzle, as we like to call it, at Sophos. And, you know, there's this huge amount of technology innovation. So how do you keep upskilled on technology? And how do you, how do you know to believe a particular vendor? Um, and this comes down to you having to do things like threat simulations and understanding of things that are going on around you and being willing to change. But time, skills and budget, as I've just talked about in detail, um, order also need to be invested, not just in cybersecurity, but attacks that are relevant to you. 
with this mindset that cyber attacks is now the norm. People are constantly being breached. As you saw at the start, two out of three organizations that we surveyed in 2018 and the start of 2019 said they've experienced some form of breach. So this is a now a regular occurrence. And this is why we need to now start looking at adopting different approaches. And, you know, Traditionally, people have talked about defense in depth. Let's not just have one vendor that deals with everything. Let's have different siloed cybersecurity products that don't that uh, don't communicate with each other, have different threat intelligence, and of course, give us what's called defense in depth. But that's no longer working. Um, and you know, Sophos has acknowledged this, a number of other vendors have as well. And now we're seeing vendors go down this attitude of cybersecurity as a system. And what that means is we're now looking at products that are working together, um, sharing real-time telemetry with one another and give you a single management console and compatibility by design. And this means that you're then not having to write APIs and hire developers and IT's not having to burn all of that time trying to um, manage cybersecurity uh, as we saw earlier. It means that things work in, in synchronicity and sharing telemetry um, means that uh, there's going to be less administration overhead and, of course, give you better visibility and better protection. Um, so, you know, as we talked about earlier, there's multi-staged attacks that come in from different angles. And if you look at phishing and malicious URLs, command and control, that's the initial stage. But then you need to focus on what happens next, a credential theft, privilege escalation, malicious binaries that come in there. That, um, and of course, what's the ultimate goal? Why do attackers actually break into your organization? And uh, I talked about that earlier, the Facebook example. In 2019, data is the new gold. It's, an, it's worth so much money to so many people. Um, but of course, if someone can't steal your data, they're encrypting your data and holding your ransom and demanding huge sums of money. You know, we're now seeing ransoms up to, um, uh, up to you know, two, three million dollars, um, which is just ludicrous. And then, of course, we've got these server side attacks. Um, once upon a time when we talked about ransomware, it was people are going after um uh, you know, people are going after the endpoint. They're just trying to encrypt a few documents. They're trying to encrypt family photos. And uh, the, the ransoms used to be five, $600. I've even seen some as little as, um, you know, uh, like five thousand dollars or uh, three hundred dollars. Sorry, it's uh, it, you know the it, it, the ransoms vary, but um, it's always been about that end user and just quick money. But now we're seeing this. Let's go after the service. Let's demand a couple million dollars. So where do we go for, to go from from here? And you know, there's a number of different steps to this impossible puzzle we call cybersecurity. But um, what I'd actually recommend you do is, um, although you've heard me uh, share stories today and talk about cybersecurity, um, go and read the full report. Um, you, you can go to selfos.com/puzzle. Um, it will ask you to enter a few details, but from there you can, of course, download this white paper. And once you've downloaded this white paper, if you're having trouble getting buy-in and shared um, mindset in your organization for cybersecurity, well, perhaps uh, reading this and sharing it with the board um, and other decision makers will assist in, um, in getting a positive outcome. Um, you know, make sure your protection's up to date, but make sure you've tested your protection re uh, recently to make sure that the vendors and the technology partners you're using have kept up to date with modern technology as well. And of course, when we look at solving this problem, this cybersecurity as a system, we call it synchronized security. This real-time sharing of telemetry and information between our endpoints, our firewalls, our email product, um, our Sophos labs, so we know in real time what products are doing and where the risks are coming from. Um, and you can read more about that at sophos.com slash synchronized. Um, I want to thank you all for joining the call today. Um, I've come in at 40 minutes, which is fantastic because that gives everybody the chance to ask any questions. Um, hopefully I can answer any on the call. Um, preferably if you've got any product questions, um, we can take that offline and focus on security today. But um, Rhea, I want to pass it 
it back to you to um to uh, ask me any questions. Sure, Ben. Thank you so much for the greater insights that you've given in this webinar. I That's just want to request all the attendees here to put in their queries if they have any. Taking forward the Q&A round, Ben, we have the first question coming in. As we talk of the budget here, how budget constraints seem to be a challenge in the organization in cyberspace, how do you think is, uh, you know, organizations can manage and properly invest in the ICT budget? Yeah, so uh, it's a really good question. So one of the things that I think is worth doing is um, a lot of IT departments share budget with uh, for cybersecurity as well, and it's perceived that cybersecurity is part of IT. Uh, I, I decoupling those two budgets and giving uh, not an IT stakeholder but a uh, an CSO or a chief security officer the say in how money is spent is obviously a really good way to make sure money's being spent more effectively. And like I was talking about earlier, making sure you're spending your money in the right uh, place is also incredibly important. So don't fish your whole organization and don't invest in, um, you know, training for just everybody. Focus on those that actually need the training and are the highest risk to your organization. Sure. As we talk of the challenges that organizations are facing in cyberspace, skill is another challenge that they face. You, in your web presentation, said 89% in India says it's a challenge to find the right expertise in cyberspace. How do you think the same can be mitigated? Yeah, so it comes down to, to that engagement. So when you find a, a really good resource, um, having that resource, um, uh, finding a way to actually keep them engaged. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, maybe they don't need to work on day-to-day -day business operations every day. If they have research that they want to work on, if they have things that they want to be involved with um, outside of the organization, whether it's cybersecurity conferences or areas of interest, let them work on it because it's going to mean the difference between them opting to work from the, for themselves as a contractor, which then gives them some spare time, or whether you get to retain that staff member and uh, keep this cybersecurity skill set in-house. Sure. The next question we have is, uh, you know, uh, some media outlets have been reporting that ransomware is on decline. However, the other reports say that 50% of the organizations have experienced ransomware. So what do you say? Is ransomware actually on decline? Not at all. Um, like I said earlier, ransomware used to be about attacking an individual, um, it, you know, a grandparent, for example, an elderly person that's got all of their family photos sitting on a folder on their desktop. And then they would say, well, for $300, you can get all of your files back. When people say ransomware is on decline, it's false because ransomware isn't declining. We're seeing less attacks with more sophistication. So the typical ransomware attack has gone from trying to fish someone and execute malware inside of their organization to trying to break into an organization, turning off their defenses, turning off their monitoring software, deleting years worth of backups and then uh, encrypting all of their data when no one's looking, normally on a Friday afternoon. So it takes a couple of days for people to realize they've been breached. Um, so once this approach has been taken, um, obviously a lot of time's been invested from a cyber security, uh, so, sorry, from a criminal perspective, these cyber criminals are spending days or weeks inside of some environments before they decide to encrypt their data. So instead of seeing huge volumes of ransomware. We're seeing less ransomware attacks, but once an attack is in their organization and knows that there's no way to actually recover, the ransoms are becoming much higher. So don't think of attacks being on the decline. Maybe we're seeing fewer ransomware attacks, but the significance and the, the chance of recovery without paying the ransom is obviously becoming much lower. Sure. You know, with India ranking the highest in software exploitation, what do you think we can do to improve the software security in an organization here? Yeah, um, a really great question. Like I said, it's a bit of a controversial topic um, and I really want to go back to coming up with a solidified patching regime. 
um, for those on the call today that are large organisations and find patching hard, my advice would be to get two, maybe three resources, have them work together and just let them focus on coming up with a really, really effective way to patch every device. Um, the only way to reduce the amount of software exploitation within India is to make sure software is up to date and uh, devices are being patched regularly. So if you've got resources to spare, please, please reassign them to a, to a solidified and quality patching regime if you don't think you're doing a good job with patching at the moment. Sure. Coming up to the last question we have, what is the assurity of data protection sent to container as a service? That is a really good question. So um, really, it's quite difficult to, to answer. Um, when it comes to, uh, you know, data stored in the cloud and within containers and how do you know that it's been stored correctly, the only thing we can really say is um, uh, you need to ask the question to your vendors. Um, to give you a bit of an idea, um, Sophos has got a public uh, reference, uh, architecture reference guide to exactly how we've designed our software as a service platform, how we're storing each customer's data, uh, data so they're separate from one another. Um, so should the platform ever be breached, it's highly unlikely for an attacker to ever get access to any information. Um, so the biggest thing that I recommend to people is ask the question. Um, ask people, or ask your software as a service provider um, exactly what they're doing to secure your data and how your data is separate from the rest of the, their customers. Sure. Thank you, Ben, for answering all the questions and also for the grateful insights that you've given in your presentations. I'm equally grateful for all the attendees for being with us today here. Stay tuned for more such webinars on ATC. So thank you and have a great day ahead. Thank you so much, everyone.